chapter 15 and 16 tonight. And, you know, I got to tell you, you know, there's, there's a lot of mixed emotion, mixed thought about Samson. And, uh, you know, was he just a knucklehead that just constantly was sexually driven? And that's the only way he made his decisions. Uh, you know, sometimes we can just glance over it and that's what we see. But I, I want you to remember something. God had a call on his life and God used him in interesting ways and specifically using him when I think you and I probably would kind of pull him out of the game maybe or give up on him. And, and I think that's something that we can hold tight to tonight specifically for us is that God's not going to pull us out of the game. He wants to use us, and He wants to do a work in this world and through us. So, uh, let's get started. Chapter 15, verse 1. I'm calling this the struggles of Samson. And the first thing we see Samson struggles with is he struggles with focus. Let's look at, uh, well, before we get into verse 1. We have, to, we have to think back a minute and remember what was the call on Samson's life. And in Judges chapter 13, verse 5, we read when the angel came to his mother and said, hey, you know, you're going to have a child. And the end of that verse, it says, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So that was God's focus for Samson to use him. So, but then we kind of ask a question, well, what did Samson, did he really seek to fulfill that call? And so far with his life, we really haven't seen that. And I don't know that we're really going to see it here. It's kind of like he's almost just happens to be in the right place at the right time, aside from his bad mistakes and, and his, his, his drive uh, that is not so godly, that God still uses him. And we've got to remember that. So verse 1. Let's pick up. After a while, in the time of wheat and harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat. And he said, let me go into my wife and to her room. But her father would not permit him to go in. So quick recap from last week. We looked at chapter 14. Samson's married. There's seven days of celebration. He makes this bet with 30 friends of the bride. And he loses the bet, and so he goes and kills 30 Philistine men to pay the debt to these 30 guys that he made a bet with. And he just kind of gets mad and leaves. Well, now he's come back, and her father will not let Samson go in to his wife. Now, it's kind of interesting that uh, he brings a goat. And uh, for some of you ladies, I don't know that if we, uh, you know, our wives especially, or guys, you're dating a girl, girl, you're dating a guy, and he comes with a goat. Uh, I don't know that that's a real great gift, but apparently in this culture, it was. In fact, we kind of read a little weird thing about that with Judah and Tamar in Genesis chapter 13. You can go look at that later. But anyway, so it's the time of wheat harvest, and that's late May, early June. Let's look at verse 2. And her father said, I really thought that you thoroughly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister better than she? Please take her instead. Now, remember that companion was Samson's best man. Now, talk about a slap in the face <laughs> if the best man ends up getting a bride. And so it appears that Samson didn't even know that his wife had been given to this guy. And dad says, hey, why don't you take her younger sister? So Samson's struggling with focus a little bit. And then we're going to see here next that he struggles with his emotions, especially keeping control of them. Look at verse 3. And Samson said to them, this time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. So he is not happy at all. And he says, this time I'll be blameless. And we have to ask, well, were you blameless prior to this? And, you know, we could rehash that whole story again. You think about that for a moment, but I'm not sure that he's blameless. Verse 4 and 5. Then Samson went and caught 300 foxes, and he took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail, and put a torch between each pair of tails. 
Now, when he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into that standing grain of the Philistines and burned up the shocks and the standing grain as well as the vineyards and the olive groves. Now, there are some things that we struggle with in Scripture. And frankly, this is one that I struggle with. Now, the word foxes here, we've got to look at a couple things. Foxes could also be translated jackals. We know that jackals are a, a native animal. They're, they run even in packs of up to 200 in this area of Israel. But to catch 300 of them and tie their tails together and tie a torch to them and light them up, I, I, <laughs> I don't know about you, but... I, I just don't see it. I'm just trying to think of the practicality of this. So there is a couple of things that we could think about. I mean, now, we, it doesn't say he did it all in one day. And it doesn't say that he didn't have any help. It doesn't say he did, but it doesn't say he didn't. So that kind of, you know, helps me open it up a little bit to see how he could possibly do it. But anyway, we, we got to keep going. So he takes these foxes, ties a torch to them, and they go running wild. Now... One of the things that we have to understand is that this crime specifically is addressed by God in Exodus, right in the margin of your Bible near this verse, Exodus 22, 6. And here's what uh, God instructed Moses, the law that, to give the people in uh, the, a law specifically to this. He says, if fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that stacked grain, standing grain, or the field is consumed, he who kindles the fire must surely make restitution. So God deals with this. And Samson, does he know? Does he not know? But it's ignorance of the law is no excuse, right? It's there. But we have to understand something. Violence instigates violence. If something happens and we get violent and we get angry about it and we're going to lash out at somebody, chances are that is what is going to come back to us. Verse, 5, uh, verse 6. Then the Philistines said, Who has done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law son of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So the Philistines came up and burned her with her father with fire. Now, their own people turned on him. Why did the Philistines think that this Timnite dad and his daughter were responsible for Samson's actions. Now, remember what Samson did in chapter 14, verse 19? He went out and killed 30 guys for no reason at all. You would think they probably thought there might be some repercussions from this action, but they burn up their own people, a father and daughter. So instead of going after Samson, this is what they turned to do. So we see Samson struggles with focus, he struggles with his emotions, and he struggles with his temper. Let's look at verse 7 and 8. Samson said to them, Since you would go and do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. So he attacked them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Then he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock of Edom. Samson takes revenge. Even though his temporary father-in-law gave Samson's bride to another man, he still took revenge on him. This really shows the depravity of the Philistine people. And they want to teach Samson a lesson and burn the bride and her father alive. Yet because of Samson's lack of self-control and disobedience, all of this has happened at great personal cost to Samson. Now, we, can sh we should consider that if Samson was obedient to the Lord, could God have used these circumstances to bless Samson instead of the circumstances causing emotional turmoil? And Samson says, listen, once I take care of you, I'm done. So this... we. There's an interesting thing, this, this hip and thigh. Some scholars say that that literally means dismemberment. So he took these guys and dismembered them. Others say that it just means a pile of bodies. Either way, it says it was a great slaughter. 
and Samson took care of business. We're not given the battle statistics of how many guys there were or what happens. All we know is that it was a great slaughter. And all of this dysfunction, God used to further his plan with the Philistines. Remember back in chapter 13, I, I, I will use Samson to begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Now, Sam, it says Samson goes and hides in the cleft of the rock at Edom. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of that, I think back of Moses wanting to see the Lord and God puts him in the cleft of the rock and covers him with his hand and walks by. That's in Exodus chapter 33, verse 22, if you want to write that down. God put Moses there for protection, but yet Samson is kind of hiding. The sad thing here is that we do not see Samson crying out to the Lord in any way. He's just, he's consumed with himself at this point. Let's look at verse 9 and 10. Now the Philistines went up and encamped in Judah. So they've come up about 30 miles. And they deployed themselves against Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? So they answered, we have come up to arrest Samson and to do his to him as he has done to us. They are looking for Samson and I, I guess they want to burn his fields like he did theirs. Verse 11. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom, and they said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, I did to them as they have done to me. Now, who was supposed to be ruling over Israel at this time? Well, the Lord was, and Samson was, in a sense, the appointed judge, so he should have been leading or doing something to deal with the Philistines. Samson's reputation was self-serving. His actions, although used by God, did not portray God's deliverance for Israel. They burned up Samson's wife and father, so he burned up their fields. So we now have three things that Samson struggles with, and the fourth one, Samson struggles, and hang on with this one, but he struggles with self-esteem. Let's look at this, verse 12. But they said to him, we have come down to arrest you that, you that we may deliver you to the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, well, swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. Israel was able to gather 3,000 men. Remember, this is Judah, the tribe of Judah. They're supposed to be the Marine Corps of the Israeli army. They can muster up 300 guys to go find Samson, but yet they will not stand and fight against their oppressors, the Philistines. What if they would have considered using Samson as an asset, like as a weapon, right? What if Samson would have taken a leadership role and gotten these 3,000 guys together and went and, done, and taken care of business with the Philistines? It doesn't appear to be in anybody's thought process, does it? He just says, swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. Again, Samson is concerned about one thing and one thing only, himself. Verse 13. So they spoke to him saying, but no, we will tie you securely and deliver you to their hand and we will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. So they come to an agreement. Samson lets them bind him. They agree that they're not going to kill him and they're taking him to the Philistines. Verse 14. Then he came to Lehi. The Philistines came shouting against him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire. And his bonds broke loose from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out with his hand and took it and killed 1,000 men with it. And then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain 10,000 men. Now, I don't know if any of you guys ever watched wrestling or if you've ever watched boxing or, you know, you watch two guys go at it. And depending on what the sport is, it could be a two minute round, a three minute round. They get a break. They go out again until one guy falls. But Samson has slain 
a thousand men. So humor me, hang here with me a little bit. I had to do a little math. So I wanted to figure out. So if Samson, it took Samson 30 seconds to kill one man. That means he killed two men for every minute, right? That means he killed 120 men per hour. And that it would have taken him eight hours and 33 minutes to whip a thousand guys. Well, 30 seconds, that might be too much, right? So let's look at 15 seconds. It takes 15 seconds to whip one guy. Then that's four guys per minute. That's 240 men per hour. And it would have taken him four hours and 17 minutes to take out a thousand men. But let's say, hey, the Spirit of the Lord's on him. Let's say that, let's just go to the extreme. Let's say he took, it took five seconds to kill a guy. One swoop, bam, he's got it, knocked him out. That means he killed 12 men per minute. He killed 720 men in an hour, and it would have taken him a hundred, an hour and 39 minutes to beat a thousand men. Do you think he was tired? Yeah, he probably was. But the interesting thing here is this instance we see the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. Now, the Jewish word is Ruach, Yehovah, right? Which means breath of God. It came upon him, right? Now, turn back, look back at verse 8 real quick. Do you see a difference? Did a, the Spirit of the Lord come on him in verse 8? Well, it doesn't tell us that it did. Uh, but... There was a great slaughter. So we don't know if it did or didn't. This one specifically says that it did. So there's a couple of ways we could look at this. The Spirit of the Lord came on him and it, the scripture doesn't tell us. Or we could take a viewpoint of that Samson has the freedom of, of choice to use this specific gift that God has given him. Um, is there something to any of this? I don't know. I'm, I'm going to let you decide that one. But I think it's just a good observance that we need to look at clearly as we study the Bible and see what that would potentially mean. And he says, heaps upon heaps, piles of, mung, uh, piles of dead men. So I had to do some more math here. A rugby field is 120 meters by 68 meters. And that's 8,160 square meters, the size of a rugby field. And if you laid a thousand men dead out on a rugby field, I just want to give you a visual of how many people that would be. That would cover almost 25% of the field laying men side by side, head to toe. That's a lot of guys for one man to take on. Verse 17. So it was that when he had finished speaking that he threw the jawbone from his hand and he called that place Ramoth Lehi, which means height of a jawbone. We see that Samson struggles with focus. We see that he struggles with his emotions. We see Samson struggles with his temper. We see Samson struggles with self-esteem. And now we're going to see Samson struggles with trusting God. Let's look at the next verse, verse 18. And then he came, became very thirsty, and so he cried out to the Lord and said, you have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? Well, notice something here. This is the first time we see Samson pray. And he prays somewhat of a selfish prayer. It's almost like he's saying, my, how God must be blessed to have me as his servant, right? He must be so thrilled that he has me assisting him here on earth. I think that causes a question for us specifically. How do we pray? Is there anything in our prayer life that may need to change? How about just frequency? How about our attitude when we pray? How about our pride? Are we more concerned about praying what the Lord wants for our lives or what we want for our lives? Verse 19, so God split the hollow place that is in Lehi, the water came out and he drank and his spirit returned and he was revived. Therefore, he called this name En Hakor, which is Lehi to this day. And to our surprise, I don't know about you, but to my surprise, God answers Samson's prayer. 
This morning in our Bible reading, Psalm 145, verse 8, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. Now, I think sometimes we can look at this guy like Samson or we have somebody in our lives that kind of acts like a Samson. And we think personally that we should withhold grace, withhold compassion, withhold mercy. But God doesn't. I think there's a lesson for us to learn here. Samson, is, does he believe that he's actually fulfilling God's call on his life? I don't know. What do you think? So we see that Samson struggles with all these things. And now I'm going to put Samson struggles with women. But I want to put a question mark behind this one. So before you just jump on board with me, Samson struggles with women. He, let's put a question mark on it first. Let's read first chapter 16. It says, Now Samson went to Gaza, saw a harlot there, and then he went into her. Now Gaza is one of five Philistine cities. We have uh, Ekron, Ash, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, and, Ga and Gaza. And they're all along the coast. Zorah, Samson's hometown, is about... Um, a 16-hour walk to Gaza. And Samson, it appears that Samson has taken a 16-hour walk to specifically go sin, as we look at this first verse. But, my, but let's look at something. Does he really go there to sin? Let's look at verse 2 and 3. When the Gazites, or the people of Gaza, were told Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and laid in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him. And Samson laid low until midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gates of the city, and the two gateposts pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now, we might consider that Samson had, a, we, I think we should consider that Samson might have had other plans than just going to spend the night with a harlot. Remember the spies that were hiding in Jericho in Joshua chapter 2? They went into the harlot Rahab's house to hide because they were spying out the land. There are a few elements that I think really connect these two stories. Now, it, it's not anything that we have to uh, uh, be dogmatic about and apply, but I think there's just some similarities and I think we should consider them. So bear with me as we go through these and consider uh, the analogy of the spies in Jericho and Samson being in Gaza. First of all, there's the female prostitute involved in each account. Right, Judges, Judges, or Joshua 2, verse 1, and right here in Judges 1, 6, uh, 16, verse 1. Both accounts, the Bible says men either enter, depending on your translation, or go in and stay with the prostitute. It doesn't specifically say that they're going in to be intimate. Now, we kind of come to that conclusion on our own. But listen, when we look at the, the spies in Joshua chapter 2, I don't think any of us considered that those guys were going into the harlot to have sexual relations with her. We don't consider that at all. But when we look at Samson, we automatically assume that that's what he's doing. Now, granted, that's kind of his M.O. at this point, but bear with me on this. The third thing is that the inhabitants of Jericho and Gaza both discover the presence of spies and the intent, and they plan on capturing them. And then the fourth thing is that the spies and Samson escape in a dramatic way. The spies in Joshua chapter 2, remember, at nighttime, she lets, a, uh, lets them out their window and they get out and escape. And in Samson, what happens here? He sneaks out at midnight, grabs the gates, the post, rips them out of the ground, off the walls, whatever, and, and leaves with them. Now, Again, bear with me here. Now, in this culture and time, if you were going to a city, what would usually happen is that you would go and you would go to the city square or the town meeting area and you would wait. And because of the hospitality of the people, 
someone would ask, are you here visiting, whatever, and then they would be hospitable and put you up for the night. But if you were not wanting to be known, or you were sneaking or hiding and not wanting anybody to know who you were or what you were doing, you would probably go to the house of a harlot. Now, uh, again, I think we should consider that Samson may have been seeking to weaken this stronghold of the Philistines, one of the five big cities of their, of their kingdom. Uh, and, and it's something we have to remember. We're getting little vignettes of Samson's life, eight to nine of them that we get here in these three chapters. Now, it says that he was a judge over Israel for, for 20 years. So uh, there's some things we don't know, but we're given specific things. Uh, but, and I think that it's very good for us to be cautious. But I think this reveals something in all of our hearts, me included. We will often assume the worst of people without giving them the benefit of the doubt and getting complete information. We just come to the worst case scenario and we think that's what it is. So for myself and for you, I want to encourage you, please be careful. Please be careful. Cautious, yes, and be careful. Now, let's talk about these gates for a moment. So in, this is the early time of the Iron Age. The Iron Age started at about 1300 BC and went to about 700 AD. So he's in here somewhere. Gates, they probably were laced with iron, made of wood. Some of them could have been made with iron. Uh, all we know is that they were probably about two stories high and probably the width to drive a small car through. Uh, and the cities had one main gate entrance uh, that people would come in and out of. So the men of Gaza assumed that that's the way Samson came in. That's the way he's going to go out. But at midnight, he takes these gates and posts and carries them to Hebron. Hebron is 40 miles away. So let's do a little math here. If you're just walking at a nice steady pace, you could walk about two and a half miles in an hour. And that is not accounting carrying a heavy load on your back. So Samson carried the, let's just say he walked two and a half miles an hour. It would have taken him 16 hours to take these gates to the mountain of Hebron. Samson struggles with focus. He struggles with his emotions, his temper, his self-esteem, his, self his trusting of God. He struggles with women, question mark. And now he struggles with women. No question mark. Let's look at Delilah. Verse 4. Afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. This is the first woman that we see in Samson's life that the Bible tells us that he loved. The word Delilah means feeble or to make feeble. Verse 5. And the Lord of the Philistines came to her, the lords of the Philistines, sorry, so the lords of each town, Ashkelon, Ashdon, uh, yeah, and the other, Gaza, and the other two. Five major cities, five lords, and you'll see what he says. He, and they say to her, entice him, find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, 1,100 pieces of silver is about 140 pounds weight. 5,500 pieces of silver is about 700 pounds in weight. This is equivalent, if we translated it to our, our money in this day and age, that would be about 162,000 400 pounds in English currency. That's a lot of money. So what do you think Delilah's motivation in this relationship is? Was Delilah willing, and what was she willing to do to get this information or this, what the Philistine lords are asking her for? Verse 6. So Delilah said to Samson, 
Please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict. And Samson said to her, Well, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not dried, then I will become weak and be like any other man. So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not dried, and they bound him. Now men were lying in wait, staying with her in her room. And she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. Now, Delilah asked where his strength comes from. So chances are Samson probably wasn't some muscle-bound bodybuilder like we see in our day. He was probably just an ordinary looking guy, average size, average height. But Samson is so callous, he thinks that he's invincible. And it's almost like he's toying with her, and in a sense he is. He lets her tie him up, right? Now, men are hiding in her room. I mean, I don't know how he couldn't figure that out. But anyway, so she announces to the enemies that he's tied up and he breaks free. And what does he do to this, these men? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us. But what we do know is he continues with this relationship with Delilah. Samson had a weakness for women. Now, on your own time, I want you to go back and read Proverbs chapter 7. And it talks about a guy who falls for a, a, a harlot, a woman that... It, it's an awful story. But I, I want you to... Take time to read it on your own and get a little perspective of what adultery, fornication, sexual intimacy outside of marriage, what that will do to a person. So we see Samson struggles with his focus. He struggles with his emotions, his temper, his self-esteem, with trusting God. He struggles with women and he struggles with discernment. Look at, look at verse 10. Then Delilah said to Samson, Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. So he said to her, Well, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And men lying, were lying in wait, again, in the, staying in the room, but he broke them off of his arms like a thread. Samson has lost all sense of reality here. Delilah, he has wrapped him, she literally has him wrapped around her finger. What man, what would a man do to, for the love of a woman? But we have to understand something. Is this love? No, this is not love. Samson allowed this game to go on because he refuses to escape this relationship. Many people today are in the exact same situation, in similar places of sin, compromise, and bondage, and they refuse to escape. Why? Well, that's a really good question. Now, I'm going to read a couple of verses to you in Proverbs chapter 7. That I told you to read that whole chapter, but the last three verses of that chapter... Solomon gives this information. He says, Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for she has cast down many wounded. All who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. Verse 13, Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me, what may you be bound with? And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into a loom, a web of a loom. So she wove it tightly with the batten of a loom and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he woke from his sleep, pulled out the batten the, from the web of the, of the loom. Delilah does not love Samson. Remember, she is being paid off. Over 162,000 pounds of currency today to get information from this guy. And that is a lot of motivation. But yet Samson continues to be blinded by this relationship. Now, remember, this is the first woman the Bible says that Samson loved. Verse 4, 
Samson loved this woman. Now, we have coined a term, love is blind, but I want you to really think about it for a moment. That phrase is really false because love is not blind. The challenge here is that Samson loved Delilah, but Delilah did not love Samson. He's getting closer and closer to revealing his strength because now he's made a comment about his hair. Verse 15, and then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. What is love? Is love telling me what I want to hear? Is love giving me what I want you to give me? Is love doing for me what I want you to do for me? No, that is not love. Why does Delilah want to know Samson's secret? She's getting paid a lot of money to get this information. And if she doesn't get the information, she doesn't get the money. So who is truly being mocked here? Samson. Verse 16. And it came to pass that when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. And he told her all that was in his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will lead me and I shall become weak like any other man. Now, verse 16 in the New Living Translation, it says that she tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. Now, we have to remember something. Samson's been here before. Remember his first wife? What's the secret to your riddle? She nagged him. She nagged him. She nagged him. Pestering, manipulation, an ulterior motive. What was Delilah's expectation from Samson? Samson was to yield all his call of God to prove his love for her? It says he did. He told her all his heart. Now, did he really love her? Or did he just think he did? Samson, Samson, listen, Samson was willing to destroy himself, his relationship with God, and the nation he was gifted to lead for a woman that did not love him. Love would not demand self-destruction of someone or demand a compromise with God. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Greg Laurie. He pastors Harvest in uh, Southern California. They do Harvest Crusades every year. Thousands and thousands of people get saved. He's a, a well-known evangelist. He's a Calvary guy. But he was sharing his testimony one time about when he first started dating his wife. And he had just gotten saved. And he said, his wife got in the car and he said to her, he said, listen, I've got to be very honest with you about something. If you ever get between me and my relationship with God, it's over. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Are we more committed to God than the people that we love dearly? We have to be. We have to be. Delilah revealed her heart. If you don't do for me what I want you to do, then that will prove to me your love. Yet Samson, his heart toward God, it wasn't toward God. It was toward Delilah. He had already compromised this. Verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up, up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the Lord of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to torment him and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and he said, listen, he said, I will go out as before, as in other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Samson had tunnel vision. Tunnel vision, you know, you're looking through a tunnel and all you see is this one little thing. You don't see any of the peripherals around you. You just see the one little thing and that's all you're focused on. He was so sensitive to Delilah, yet he had become so callous to God. He didn't even notice that he was shaved and that the Lord left him. His strength had left him. Now, we have to ask a question. Why now? 
I mean, he's touched a dead animal. He's gotten honey out of a dead lion. He gave it to his parents. He's hanging out in a vineyard. Uh, he was probably drinking at his first wedding party. He picks up the jawbone of an ass, something dead, a donkey, to whip a thousand guys with. Why now? Well, here's why. Because for a Nazarite vow, the shaving of the head meant that the vow was over. The cutting of the hair proclaimed he was done. Now, his hair was not the source of strength. His hair was a symbol of his commitment to the Lord, even though Samson blatantly disregarded everything else. God wanted to use Samson, yet his relationship with Delilah literally brought Samson to his knees. Samson had lived a life with repetitive compromise for so long, and he became callous. His sin didn't matter. He conditioned himself that he would get away with sinning. Moses warned Israel when they were heading into the promised land that there would be consequences for their sin and their lack of obedience. Right in the margin of your Bible, Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. Moses said this, Now, but if you do not do so, you know, if you're not obedient, if you're, if you're not going to follow the Lord and you're going to sin, you need to take note. You have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. Paul kind of addresses this in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. You know, you have these people that were going on sinning because Paul said, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So these people literally thought, that, well, if I sin more, well, then God's grace will just be on my life more. And Paul addresses this. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. Therefore, if we were buried with him through baptism to his death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we should walk in the newness of life. So often we mistake God's patience, his mercy, and his grace for his acceptance of our sin. We must spend time in God's word to know what sin is. If we are not convicted about the sin in our lives, something is wrong. We should be walking in newness of life. So listen, all this closes. The final thing Samson struggles with, Samson struggles with Samson. Let's look at verse 21. Then the Philistines took him and put his eyes out, and they brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again, and after it had been shaven. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. And they said, Our god has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. When the people saw him, they praised their god, and they said, Our god has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. So it happened when their hearts were married that they said, Call for Samson, that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them. And they stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, Let me fill the pillars which support the temple, so that I can lean on them. And now the temple was full of men and women, and the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women, on the roof, watching while Samson performed. Is this how God wanted to use Samson? I don't think so. Serving the lords of the Philistine, serving the Lord, brings blessing to our lives. And it brings blessing in spite of our circumstances. Samson had so much potential. He had a gift that we've never seen again in any other person. Verse 28. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. 
Samson prays for a second time, and it is still about Samson. Samson wants vengeance for the Philistines taking his eyes. Nothing of humility or obedience to God, but yet again, God answers. Why? Because God can still use Samson. Let's wrap this up, verse 29. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars, which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might. And the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it, so that the dead that he killed in his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and his father's household came and took him and brought him up to be buried between Zorah and Eshcol and the tomb of his father Manoah. And he judged Israel 23 or 20 years. What characteristics do we see in Samson? What characteristics do we see in God? How can this story be applied to our lives as followers of Jesus? Now, I just want to wrap this up. Turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11. Now, if you don't know this, Hebrews chapter 11 is kind of the hall of faith for people in the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to get in verse 32. And the writer of Hebrews says, and what more shall I say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, also of David and Samuel the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, and turned to flight, the armies of aliens or enemies. In spite of all what you might think about Samson, he's here in Hebrews chapter 11. We can look at this a couple of ways. Samson was a knucklehead and God can use knuckleheads. Yep, that's a way we can look at it. We can look at this as a warning of leading a painful, miserable life in our walk with God. Let's not do that. Listen, let's be obedient to the Lord, trust in his word, follow him as he leads us, and take step by step our walk with him in our day-to-day -day lives and watch him use us and do amazing things. Father, we